It's Miro. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Uh, we Hi. You this is your yard on your side. Okay. Yeah, but I don't know what's going on. My window is at a weird angle. Okay, I think that's better. Should I move yeah. this a little bit? <laughs> I don't know what is the best way. Head, no matter what. Okay. Yeah. We can see the chat. That's <laughs> Yeah, but hello everyone. Welcome to join our info session today, online chats. Um, so my name is Liao Zhao. I am the head of outreach at Communication Leadership, and we have my colleagues to join us today as well. I would like to introduce. Hi, I'm Alex Stonehill. I'm the head of creative strategy for Conley. And I'm Heather Workle. I'm the assistant director of academic services for Conley. And today we also have our student representative, Megan, to join us. Megan? Hi, I'm Meg, uh, cohort 18. Yeah. Um, so before we get started, we just want to make sure that you can hear us very well. So could you please tap yes in the chat box if you can hear us so we can know. Okay, perfect. Um, and also thanks, this is our third online chess of whether um, probably most of you have already participated in our info session before, either in person or online. If this is your first time to join us, could you please also tap in the chat box says first time so we can notice about that. Okay, so many of you are first time. So we can yeah, go over with our program um, overview and our history very briefly before we start with our Q&A session. So for people who join us for the first time, you can get a chance to know about more about our program. Um, so in terms of our um, history of our program, and I want to share with that, um, our program has been around for 20 decades. So we, our yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, two decades, 20 years, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And communication leadership started to respond to, for, to changes in the communication field and where to prepare professionals for new opportunities and technologies for storytelling and in professional communication. So currently we have two uh, check for our program. So the first one is Master of Communication in Digital Media. And the second one is Master of Communication uh, in Community and Network. So currently we already have like more than 600 alumni like working in yeah different um, organizations globally. Um, and today I think the good chance is we have our head of creative uh, strategy to join us because I know that many of you in the past have asked questions such as what kind of internship or uh, partner program opportunities that we have. So maybe we could ask Alex to share a little bit about that. Yeah, to give us a general. Yeah, yeah. should I do that right now or? Do you want to share that? No, now? that's okay. <laughs> now is good or later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, part of, a big part of my role here is to develop our um, community partnerships and our partnership program, um, which essentially is part of uh, our ethos at Comlead is uh, to take our learning beyond the classroom um, and give students opportunities to apply the things they're learning in classes. Um, out in the, the world uh, as ways of both building their portfolios um, and making community connections, building their networks, um, and also sometimes earning a little bit of uh, support, uh, financial support for their, their tuition um, and expenses for being in the program. Um, so the main way that that happens is through uh, what we call the partner program, um, which are tailored opportunities that we develop with um, different organizations, usually mission-based organizations here, mission-driven organizations here in the Pacific Northwest, um, and they're one-quarter projects where students are paid a $1,500 scholarship um, to do basically like less like an internship and more like communications consulting work. So sometimes that's producing a video um, that an uh, organization needs to hone their message. Sometimes it's more of a broader like messaging strategy. Um, these projects have ranged really across the board. Sometimes th this quarter we're doing one that's a crisis communication strategy based on our crisis communication class. So um, the best uh, of these opportunities kind of flow directly out of a class that you would have taken earlier in your time at Comlead and 
then you're going to take the things that you learned there and apply them out in the world. Um, another way that we uh, take that learning beyond the classroom is with partnerships in specific classes where there'll be a client relationship and you'll be working um, with a client or a number of clients through the class. So for instance, this quarter coming up, we have a class on decision science um, and the sort of heuristics and uh, other uh, ways that, that people make decisions and the ways that we can nudge them to make the decisions that we want them to, which the traditionally that field has been thought of as um, something in the for-profit sector more, um, but it's moving more into the, you know, how can we make people make the right decisions for good or in their own interests even when it comes to like government programs. So we've lined up a number of clients that are working with that uh, project, everything from an ecological organization trying to protect the Columbia River Gorge here nearby um, to uh, uh, Crosscut, which is an online news um, publication here in Seattle that's trying to uh, boost their membership and get people who read it to donate to, to help to pay for it, essentially to subscribe. So uh, you can see how some of the things that you're learning in classes get applied out in the world and have a real impact and then also help you build your resume and portfolio. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Alex. Of course. Yeah, it's true that uh, a lot of our partner opportunities are integrated into our curriculum. So in terms of our curriculum and currently, um, I would say that um, we are doing the updates every year for mm -hmm. our curriculum. And currently we have uh, different aspects. So eight focus areas in total. So including content strategy plus user experience, marketing and analytics, organizational and professional communication, um, community and leadership, storytelling, ethics and law, emerging technology and communication and cultures. So students can decide to focus on um, one area or take classes across the different topics. And I want to say um, for the curriculum, maybe our students, uh, Megan, could share more about that because as a student, you have through like four quarters already. Um, so let me um, give the conversation to Megan a little bit. And would you like to share a little bit about what is your favorite class in your program so far? Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me okay? My headphones are weird. Okay, great. Um, so I think my favorite class so far has been Lauren Kessler's class, which is the principles of storytelling class. Um, and what I really li I liked a lot of things about that class. But one of the things that I really liked is that Lauren, the teacher, is just so experienced. Um, and so a lot of what she talked about in class was her own experience reporting and writing nonfiction books. Um, so it was really cool to hear her, you know, not only just talking about like, here's the theory, but like, here are skills that I've actually applied in my very successful career as a writer. Um, so I really like that piece of it. And also just the skills that we learned in that class, I thought were really useful. Um, I work, I'm a content writer and I do a lot of blogs and articles and things like that for healthcare. Um, and the way that Lauren kind of approaches storytelling is through a lens of, you know, what's the issue that we're trying to bring, you know, light to or trying to teach people about and what's kind of a small story that we can tell that highlights that issue. Um, so people in the class did so many different things. There was a girl who did a story about Camp Kesem, which is um, a summer camp for kids whose parents have cancer. There was a girl who did a story about a wildlife marine rescue, a woman who worked in that space. Um, so it was just really cool also to see what everyone kind of came up with that class and to see like, here's a bunch of issues that people care about. And here's a bunch of stories about people that are really compelling that really, I guess, shed light on those issues. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing, Megan. Um, since you already shared about this, I wonder, like, when you started the Complete program, what surprised you? A few things. Um, I think one of the things that you were talking about earlier with all the different focuses of the program, I think it was really interesting to see all of the different, I guess, skill sets people were bringing to the program or skill sets that people were hoping to learn in the program. So one of the things that I've really liked about the core classes so far is that there's such a diverse group of people and skills in those classes. So for example, you'll get put into a team of four or five people and someone's got a design focus and some people has more of um, I guess like a community engagement focus and some people has have more of a strategy focus so being you know working in teams with all of those different types of people i think is really cool um and i think it also just puts you in a space to create portfolio pieces that are really really good because you know you're probably not going to be a really good designer and strategist and writer and all the things but working in a team with people who are focusing in those different areas was really you know i found it very beneficial um, and something else that I've really liked about the program so far um, that I talked to about a little bit earlier is just the fact that the professors aren't just teachers, they're experienced professionals. So I think, 
you know, for me, I came to this program because I wanted to, you know, have skills that I could use in my career and build connections that I could use in my career. And that's very much the case with all the professors, or I mean, not all the professors I've had at least. Um, so, you know, they really make a point to leverage their network and to bring in guest speakers who work in the space or, you know, have experience working on a certain type of project. So it's also, it's, you know, not just their skill set, but their network. Um, so I think that the, you know, the quality of the professors and the professional skills and networks they have is really beneficial. Okay, thanks, Megan. Yeah. Um, so our admission deadline is coming closer uh, for the priority deadline is February the 3rd. Um, so now let's move to more about application questions. And Megan, do you want to have any application suggestions to share with everyone before we move into the Q&A? And also, uh, for people who are over the screen, you can tap your questions in the chat box so we can answer your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my biggest tip is proofread and have someone else proofread. Um, I write for a living, but I make a lot of little errors and I'm very thankful that we have Mary, our copy editor. Um, and I think that that's the case with like anything, you know, you spend so much time working on a personal statement or something like that. And, you know, it can be really beautifully written, but it's really easy to make small typos. So I guess just make sure that you have someone proofread and have someone help edit. Um, I guess I, not really sure what else um if the people have specific questions but that's always a mistake i make so that's what i tell other people okay so now we already thanks megan so we already got a couple questions from our students so let's start with the first one from marion so could you please uh, could you describe an ideal candidate for the program yeah, uh, maybe I can speak to it f uh, from the, the admissions, <laughs> the admissions standpoint. review standpoint. Yeah, I'm on the admissions committee probably this coming year. So I think the main thing that we look for, like like Meg said, uh, it's not a specific background or a specific profile. We have people with a lot of different uh, undergraduate majors, a lot of different um, skill sets, a lot of different levels of professional experience. And usually it's about knowing who you are and then where you want to go and being able to articulate how Comlead is going to get you there or how you think Comlead is going to get you there. So that's what you should be trying to, to show us in your, your admissions material. Um, it's not necessarily that you're this fully baked, you know, perfect <laughs> candidate uh, yet, but that you are going to use our program to, to get somewhere and you know, you know where that is kind of, um, if that makes sense. Anything you'd add to that, Heather? You can change, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> right, we'll just your section now. We're swapping seats here, <laughs> since I'll probably be answering a lot of these. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with everything Alex said, and he's an admissions reviewer, so obviously his, his, his opinion is was one of those that makes the decisions. Uh, but because of the type of questions I get, we want to stress that we're not looking for, the, for someone with a specific work background or a specific, you know, academic background. Um, you have to have a bachelor's degree and to apply. But other than that, it doesn't matter what your major was. It doesn't matter if you've ever taken a comm class um, or if you've worked in the industry. Um, it's really like Alex said, where do you want to go and how is this degree going to help you get there? And can you articulate that um, very clearly? So um, I definitely want to stress that because that's one of my most common questions I get. Do you have to be a comm major? Do you have to have worked in the industry? Nope, and no. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd, one more thing I'd add is that one of the core emphases in our program is storytelling. It's kind of at the center of everything that we do. Um, and that, in some cases, is, is uh, expressed really specifically in storytelling classes where we're learning to create videos or the class Meg referenced. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit more loosely. But uh, that's something that certainly you can learn and you will learn in our program. But bringing some of those instincts to the application can be really good, too. So. Uh, I would just define that from rather than a list of things that you've done and a list of accomplishments, you have a space in the application to upload your resume and that's the perfect place to give us that list. And then beyond that, you know, in the, in the video and the written statement, um, tell us stories about who you are and again about how uh, you think that this program is going to help you uh, transform, get where you want to be and, um, and make those distinct stories, right? You don't need to say the same thing in the video as you do in that. that the written statement, I would use those two different venues. We definitely look at all of every application. Um, so, you know, we want to hear something different in the video than we hear mm -hmm. in the written statement. That's a great segue to the next question, which is asking about what makes for a great application video? How specific does our story need to be? So as someone who's watched a lot of these videos, yeah. what are you looking for? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're definitely not looking for them to be, this is 
very explicitly laid out, but they don't need to be like highly produced or anything like that. We've become more and more, a few years ago, we would, uh, you know, the, the running joke was like, uh oh, it's a vertical video, even that's changing now. <laughs> so um, none of that technical stuff really matters beyond our ability to comprehend it. It needs to be, the, the sound needs to be clear enough to hear it. It needs to be easy to watch, but it doesn't need to be technically proficient beyond that. Um, it's really much more about, uh, I mean, honestly, getting, having a, a video that can kind of get our attention in some way based on what you're saying. And again, that's, um, you know, these, these kind of storytelling principles of um, giving us some kind of hook where, you know, how can you help us remember you? And I'm not talking about like gimmicks, don't just be the person with the funny hat, but say something <laughs> meaningful about uh, what you want to do in this program and who you are. And um, that, that will usually be the thing that kind of like sticks in our heads and that, that we'll be able to remember both um, when we go back to the applications and even once you become a student. And we're back. Yay. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> we had a Wi-Fi issue in the building. All right, let me get back up here to what our questions were. Um, okay, so I think we covered the video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we'll move on to the next one, um, which was, is there any teaching or research assistantships available for students? So we are a professional program. Um, unlike the University of Washington has professional programs and then there are academic programs. Um, so the academic research programs are the ones that tend to have those teaching assistantships and research assistantships. Um, that's true for the communication departments. Um, it's uh, the PhD program that has those. So we do not have um, TA or RA positions. We do have the partner program, which provides that hands-on experience and some scholarships. And then we have a lot of students who either work on campus or they um, do internships um, to get that kind of on-the-job experience um, while they're in the program uh, as well. And maybe, Meg, would you mind just sharing, because you've done a few of those different things in the partner program and the internship, could you just talk really quickly about, you know, what your uh, kind of paid scholarship opportunities have been while you've been in Conley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first one I did was with CoMotion, which is UW's, um, I guess, innovation hub slash incubator. They do a lot of work with startups and things like that. Um, so I worked with their communications team to build out their blog and newsletter a bit more. Um, so it was kind of sporadic and 
uh, I guess, very like single platform. They didn't have a lot of videos and stuff like that. So I worked with them to have more of an editorial calendar and did a lot of interviews, went to some of their events and stuff like that. So uh, I guess just helps them get their blog up and running. Uh, so that was the first one I did. And then the second one I did was a video project with, um, I guess, an initiative called 2100. So their goal is to tell positive stories about environmental and sustainability work on campus. Um, so I worked with them to, I guess, both kind of define their brand voice and figure out what they wanted these videos to look like and then also create um, two videos for them. Um, so, I mean, it was, they were both really cool opportunities to, I guess, step outside my comfort zone a little bit. I guess I'm very comfortable with writing. That's what I do for the most part. But um, I did a bit of video work in undergrad, but hadn't done much since. Um, so the work with 2100 was a really good opportunity to get back into that and to do, um, I guess, just sort of to apply it to a new skill. So I've always been interested in um, sustainability and science communication. Um, so that was also a really cool way to, I guess, have another portfolio piece that speaks to that side of my interest. So, and also it's really nice to have a scholarship. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's a good opportunity both to get that hands-on experience and to have a few more things to add to your portfolio with real world companies or nonprofits or things like that, and also to get paid for it. So yeah, and as opposed to the sort of research assistantship model, um, these tend to be more applied uh, opportunities as Meg's describing. And we're finding that more and more, you know, it certainly should be said that there's not, uh, you know, there's not hundreds of those. Um, there's, you know, maybe a dozen every quarter or something like that. Um, so uh, not every student has that opportunity, not every student wants that opportunity, but we are finding more and more that the word is spreading around campus that different units are coming to us and saying, oh, you know, this thing that you did with co-motion, um, we would really love to do that at the uh, School of Public Policy or the School of Social Work. They, these skills are, are very useful around campus and around the community. Everybody is looking for these kind of communication skills. Um, so we're, we're working on building as many of those partnerships as we can, both here on campus and even working on developing some fixed quarterly internships with different uh, firms, PR firms and communication firms around Seattle as well. Nice. Um, so our next question is going to be uh, for Alex again. <laughs> um, can you expand on what the new mid-career emphasis option is? Can yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So that's being, uh, it's in development right now. We've been doing, I've been doing research on it uh, over the last six months or so, um, interviewing some of our students who have gone through our program uh, recently who have been you know, we're not usually really defining it by age, but more uh, how much career experience you have, um, because, you know, certainly I would say about a quarter of our students have, uh, you know, five plus years of, of work experience before they come to the program, something like that. Um, so we're working on ways that we can serve those, pro those students uh, and their desires through the program, which tend to be a little bit different than students who are coming straight from undergrad or just have a couple of years out in the, in the workforce um, and how we can then really have, continue to serve both of those populations in their different needs. So um, I'll try to remember all three of the pieces of this. Um, the, the first piece will be uh, curricular in, in, in our curriculum. We're hoping to identify some existing classes and then develop some new classes that are really specifically tailored to um, mid-career folks, probably with more of a leadership emphasis, which is there throughout the curriculum, but the way that you think about leadership when you're at the beginning of your career versus when you're in the middle of your career is obviously very different. So um, some course offerings that specifically recognize that. And then we're, our program is very strong on, uh, you know, career, helping students develop their, their career opportunities, specifically career consulting and counseling, um, which we do now. But uh, again, that's something that's very different. So we're developing a program there that puts mid-career students directly in touch with people in our alumni network who might have the kind of job that that person is thinking about pivoting to. A lot of our mid-career students are, you know, I'm in one field and I want to move to this other field or um, I'm in one field and I'm trying to think about like how this, this getting a master's degree is gonna help me take the next step um, up the rung. And sometimes that's about both making connections, but also hearing from somebody like, what does that job look like, right? What is that job that I want to get actually entail? Um, so we're going to try and emphasize that more directly and specifically for mid-career students. And then the third piece, oh yes, I remembered all three, is a, a <laughs> capstone project that will, in most of our partner program projects and our applied learning projects in class um, tend to be a little bit more directed and we go and create those opportunities and then 
you know, open them up to students and they apply for them. Um, so this will be give the students more of an opportunity to develop their own uh, project that they want to do either with the company that they currently work for or perhaps with the company that they want to work for and they'll, they'll we'll help them make those arrangements but uh, it will be more of a applied project that that gets them you know hopefully working on the specific thing or at, even at the specific company that they want to be and hopefully give them an opportunity to do something essentially pro bono or scholarship supported um, or possibly for academic credit that also um, kind of gets them in the door at the place they want to be. So those are the, the, the pillars of that initiative, but as you can see, it's we're trying to put some intentional thought into um, you know, making the experience as productive uh, and positive as possible for people who are at that place further along in their career. And so we're piloting this for 2020, and it's going to be five to 10 um, students, probably in this first pilot. Yeah. Group. And, and so for, for those who are, are sitting there thinking about your application on this, there is a, a question on the application that essentially asks you to, to kind of self-select for this program um, and say, you know, why you would be interested in it and um, just write a short statement. And I would certainly encourage you if you're looking at that and saying, well, I'm not sure if that's right for me or not. Um, there's no cost to kind of trying to, 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 to answering that question and opting in, um, it will be actually really helpful to us the more people. I hear again and again, as I talk to folks who were in this position coming in, that I think everybody experiences a little bit of imposter syndrome when they go into grad school. I'm actually a student in this program right now as well. I just started this year and I've been working here and teaching in this program for almost 10 years now. And I still felt like, is this right for me? Am I going to be, you know, good enough? Am I going to, uh, am I going to be able to handle the more technical classes? All sorts of stuff. So that comes up for almost everybody. Um, so uh, I guess don't let that feeling discourage you <laughs> from saying, yeah, I'd be interested in, you know, I'm in this further along position in my career. I'd be interested. In. It's essentially you're telling us that you want to learn more about it. Yeah. In, in answering the question on the application. And since this has come up a few times too, if it doesn't apply to you, if you know, like, no, I'm not a mid-career person, it's an optional question. So just leave it blank. Just don't answer that part of the application. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next question was, what's the best way to inquire about financial aid opportunities prior to applying? I would like to apply next year and we need to explore those before applying. Um, so on our website under the program, um, same place where you find the how to apply, the admissions webpage, there's a page called fees and financing. Um, so definitely click on that. We've compiled there um, a lot of different uh, funding options, either both within University of Washington and externally. Um, so definitely recommend reading through that. Uh, I would say the majority of our students um, use financial aid, um, you know, the regular FAFSA application, same as undergrad. Um, at the graduate level, that's primarily student loans. Um, there aren't as many um, other options for graduate uh, study. We also have students using employer uh, tuition reimbursement and depending on where you work. Um, I know there's some people from Boeing joining us today and I know there's a, a tuition reimbursement there as well as a lot of other companies. Um, and so that's another option. We also have a number of students using GI Bill, um, so veteran benefits. Um, and then we have some students who get creative and either based on their employer tuition policy or just their own savings, will kind of go on and off. They'll take a quarter um, and pay their tuition for one class, and then they'll take the next quarter off to save that money. Or if their employer only has a certain amount per year, they do that to kind of manage their way through the program. So it is a flexible program in that you can take quarters off. You have six years total to complete um, basically nine classes. So there's a lot of uh, leeway there, um, as long as you take the core classes in the first year that are required fall and spring. Um, but other than that, there are lots of creative ways to move through the program. So definitely check out that fees and financing page um, for some of those options. I'm going to switch seats here because the next question is asking, okay. what career development resources do you provide for students, which is Liao's area? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to share about that because um, part of my role is to help students with career development. So one thing that we do is it is actually going to happen this Friday is like we have monthly first Friday event where we connect our students with a particular organization and organization so students are able to either connect with their recruiter and with um, their leadership team to learn more about their organization and to learn more about what kind of job openings that they have. So in the past, we have been hosting this first Friday event at uh, We Communications, at Microsoft, at Amazon. And this upcoming Friday, we're going to host it at UW uh, Commotion. So focusing on our startup and also like entrepreneurship. 
Um, so that is a great way for students to make net strong, um, expand your network and get to know new people. And um, so I would say one of our student active from cohort 18, she actually went to our October 1st Friday, um, last October at We Communication, and she got a job through that networking event. Um, so that's a great way. Uh, the second thing is um, every Monday I shared with our uh, complete students and alumni about our jobs email. So every time when I share the newsletter about our jobs, I make sure that we always have a connection at that particular organization. It could be either from recruiter or from our complete alumni. So if you are a complete student, even though after you finish your program and even after you become a complete alumni, you're still able to get access, access to this resource. Um, and other than that, we also have career workshop um, every quarter. So currently we work through our uh, career coach, Lindsay, and she will help you to get ready for your career development step-by-step. Step. So this upcoming um, January, by the end of January, she will host a great workshop at, with our complete students. Um, and we also have our alumni fellows and they host workshop as well, because our alumni fellows are probably like young professionals or middle career professionals at different organizations, uh, for example, like SAP at Microsoft. So they will share with their professional experience with our students as well. So all of this are available like career resources that you can reach out to. And in addition to that, outside our communication leadership program, I would say UW has a lot of Korea resources that you can reach out to. So for example, like at UW Crit Center, um, it hosts like workshops, crit fairs. Um, so if you want to take advantage of that, you should definitely do that. Yeah. Okay. Should we switch it? Um, this next one is kind of you too. Um, what is the placement rate after the program and what kind of positions can students think about after the program? So where do our alumni work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I like this going to get a. Oh, maybe it's on. Oh, it is on the other side. Yeah. So um, on our we have like a bro printed brochure. It shows like where our alumni works after they graduate. On our homepage. Yeah, it's also on our main page, home page. So if you can take a look, like after our students graduate, they normally like work at. It could be like a tech companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook or like a PR agency, like We Communications, um, like uh, Weber Shenwick, or it could be like nonprofit organizations. And the position that they work with could be like really like diverse because our focus are very diverse. So students could be like a content designer, could be a storyteller, and could be working on marketing or even as a like UX designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then a lot of yeah. community outreach on the MCCN side. Right. There's a lot of like community outreach officer, uh, those kinds of roles. Um, so typically they tend to be, yeah, there we have a lot of people going from this program directly into UX content strategy roles. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a pipeline developed. There has been one into Facebook for a while and then Microsoft is, mm -hmm. that one is developing quite a bit. Um, you know, we have alumni at Amazon who do things like, I guess their jobs are their job titles are content strategy, but they'll be like the people who mm -hmm. write the product blog for Amazon Web Services for specific products. Um, so a lot of like writing jobs inside the tech world. And then, um, you know, we have alum or, or uh, alum at REI is, I believe his title is their chief storytelling officer or something like that, but he's developing all of their mm -hmm. digital and now they just launched a print magazine as well. Um, so developing content, um, you know, almost things that you would traditionally call journalism, but that world is changing so much that sometimes it's happening uh, in the corporate sector or um, the nonprofit sector more. Um, and we also have our students, alumni, uh, start their own startups or entrepreneurship after they graduate. And actually this is, yeah, you're going to, if you're in the Seattle area, I strongly encourage you to join us this Friday at the commotion event. So you would be able to talk with uh, some of our complete alumni. Uh, so, for example, like we have Susan Tai, and she's the general manager at Fund One. It is like food delivery startup. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So a couple of different like. Yeah. yeah. Andrew Mitrak is that uh, I 
believe he's the he's the head director, communication or yeah. communication director for Haptics, which is a VR startup. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jordan Milagrano, who's also on our faculty now, uh, is the has his own uh, basically communication consulting and video production company for mission driven organizations called Block by Block Creative. So we have a lot of students who are yeah in the startup world, either at a small company running the communication role um, or uh, starting their own company. And then obviously as the, the companies get bigger, the roles get more specified, but they tend to be everything in the communication and community uh, oriented kind of world. And we, we're seeing those, those positions are definitely the number of them are growing. And I think the, the corporate world is starting to value uh, communication skills more as, as leadership skills. Um, and so we're seeing more sort of higher level positions that really Um, next question, do students in the program often work full time while taking classes? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Meg can probably speak to that a little bit. Um, I think it's very common. I guess it's probably about 50 50. Or yeah, it it's changed? just under half. Right now. Yeah, we just like shifted. <laughs> yeah. So typically we would recommend for students who are working part time to take one class a quarter. Uh, that's what I'm doing. And it's, you know, manageable. I have two small children as well. And my wife is in grad school. So um, it's definitely doable to work full time and, and take one class. Um, it means you give up some of your evening hours either to be in class or to uh, do homework and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so like, like Megan, or like Heather said, it's about 50-50. And um, Meg, would you mind talking about your experience? You've been working full time as you've been a student, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've been working full time the whole time and just taking one class at a time and taking summers off. Um, and that's been manageable for me. Um, I think it's it's a good balance. Um, I've had a few friends who've done full time school and full time work and it seems like it's very like scatterbrained and just kind of hard to focus on everything and do everything well. Um, so for me, it's it's been a good balance. And I feel like I'm taking the time to take these classes. I want to, you know, focus on them and be present in class and, you know, put time into the assignments. Um, but it's doable. Um, I think I've also gotten pretty good at, like, figuring out how to do assignments on a schedule that works for me. A lot of the teachers will assign homework that's also audiobooks or podcast listening or something like that. So it's kind of nice that I can do that when I'm commuting or like on the treadmill or something. So it's, you know, it's, I guess for me, it's just been about finding the right balance, but it's definitely doable. And we actually discussed this a little when we were talking about the faculty. I, oftentimes the faculty will be more accommodating, I think, because they're in the same boat kind of. Yeah. Uh, probably two thirds of our faculty are working professionals who, you know, come and teach the class as, a, as an add on to what they do um, at their, their day job. And usually it's obviously related to what they're doing there. But that means that they're going to be able to relate to your feelings having come from work and then going to class and, and the time constraints that come along with that. And then the other third or so of faculty are, are you know, sort of will be professors or lecturers here in the communication department typically who have are more in the academic world. And I, I think that's a great balance of having kind of some of each. Uh, it, it, I think, makes for a really well-rounded education. You get some of the theoretical stuff from the academic people, and then you get a lot of the applied mm -hmm. stuff from the, the working professionals. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to switch? <laughs> yeah, it's your question. I understand. Yeah. Um, and while we're on the subject of that, I noticed there's a question further down about the class schedule. Um, and so we, we do have a lot of full-time students um, or people working full-time in the program. The classes all meet in the evenings and on weekends. Take your hand, chair. I want to stand up. <laughs> um, uh, so the classes all meet on a Monday through Thursday, um, one of those evenings, 6 to 10, or on Saturdays, um, 9 to 5 every other week, um, so once every two weeks. Um, and if you go to our classes page on the website, um, so go to comlead.uw.edu and go to classes, you can see um, the times and days for um, current quarter or just look through and look at other quarters to get an idea. Summer has some different schedules. Um, so check that out if you're interested in summer classes. It has some intensive classes that only meet for a week. Um, so it's a great way to get you know, a class you know, taken care of in one week, take a week off work, and then you have the rest of your summer free. So lots of different options there for full-time workers. And next question was, how competitive is the program? What's the acceptance rate? All depends on how many applications we get. <laughs> um, we have a fairly fixed size for the cohort based on the size of rooms on campus uh, for our core classes. Um, we've had around, uh, the last several years, it's been about 85 students per cohort. That might go up a little bit in the future, um, but it's that around 90 students is kind of what we're, we're aiming for. 
Um, and so last year we got about 350 applications. Um, so it was about a third um, of applicants got admitted. So again, all depends on how many people apply. Um, we're hoping to get more. Every, every year for the last five years, it's gone up. Um, we've gotten more applications every year. So we'll see what happens in February. All right, what is the process if I wanna pursue both tracks once admitted? This is on hold right now. So we're working with the graduate school. We've had to change how that happens and how that works. So the answer for right now is I don't know because <laughs> we're waiting on a number of people um, to you know, get back to us and for the university to figure out how that's gonna work. So for now, if you are interested in both in your letter of intent, definitely mention that. Uh, you have to apply to just one coming in. So do not submit two applications, you're wasting money. Um, it would just be a duplicate. The admissions committee reviews all of the applications for both degrees. So only submit one, you know, choose which one you feel is the better fit. Um, and then we will be communicating with, with students once they're enrolled as to what that process will look like once it's figured out. But we're relatively yeah. confident that it will continue to be a possibility going Yeah, forward. we're just yeah. figuring out how yeah. that will happen. We've had to change how that works. Um, so stay tuned um, to be determined on that. Um, but again, I, def I definitely want to emphasize do not submit two applications. You're wasting $85. Like, please don't, because it's just a duplicate. So pick one. And if you're having a hard time deciding which one um, to apply to, what I usually recommend students do is go to that classes page that has all of our offerings for the current year and the last couple of years, um, and keep a tally. Look at the classes you're interested in. They'll say MCDM elective, MCCN elective, or track neutral. Um, track neutral applies to both degrees, so it doesn't matter what degree you're in. You can take as many of those as you like, but kind of keep track of how many you're really interested in are in the MCDM or the MCCN, and usually you'll find that you're interested in more classes in one degree than the other. That's the degree you should apply to. Um, so I find that's really the best way to choose um, is by what you'll actually be taking. Um, I already answered that. Oh, is this a suitable program for people interested in working in the entertainment industry, specifically in Hollywood? Mm, that's a great question. So uh, we just had a profile that's on the website of Sam Juneman. I guess she's more in music, but in, in LA, a universal music group on, and she d talks in that profile. It's an interview with her talking about how she leveraged her, her skills that she developed in the program um, to start with a social media role. And I think now she has more of a artist facing role where she kind of liaises with the artists. Um, so there certainly is a, a pipeline there. Um, we're definitely teaching a lot of um, digital storytelling skills, which tend to be, um, as opposed to, you know, a film school where you might be learning to do a specific role on a, on a bigger production, like you know, do lighting or be the, uh, the cinematographer or be the um, continuity person or whatever it is. Um, these, we tend to kind of start from the ground up and teach these classes so that uh, you learn how to do everything. And we, you're gonna learn the technical stuff like, uh, you know, how to run a camera if you don't already know or how to edit uh, in, you know, Adobe Premiere or other editing software, but that's not the core emphasis. That's like almost a side skill that you learn by doing. And most of the emphasis of the actual classes is around um, the, the storytelling skills uh, and those principles um, around the interpersonal dynamics of, you know, running a production team, maybe uh, the dynamics of working with a source or working with an actor, um, those kinds of things. So uh, I would say, you know, I'm trying to think of, of other alumni who are in like Hollywood per se, we have a lot more people who are in, uh, you know, production companies, um, smaller production companies that are working for nonprofits creating or, or corporations creating video assets for them. Um, as far as like Hollywood pipeline, I would think it would actually probably trend to be as much in uh, the um, marketing and outreach parts of that world as it would be in, you know, uh, you know, movie director or, or you know the actual production part of it it could be you could be learning skills that would apply to either but it's certainly not like a 
a not super a film established program. Pipeline, pipeline. We're not a yeah. film program. Yeah, we're not a film program. There are programs that are film programs. It's not um, what we do, but we have people that do video for other purposes. Yeah, so. and like there are filmmakers. Uh, one of our faculty in the storytelling track is Matt Chan, who started Screaming Flea Productions, which is one of the bigger production companies here in Seattle that uh, he's most famous for the, the, the Andy show uh, Hoarders. So he was like a reality TV producer. Uh, my background is in film and journalism, and I made a, do a documentary film. Um, there are certainly uh, another storytelling faculty, Jay Howard, was a TV commercial producer for, or he did a bunch of the big Apple commercials, basically um, everything for the last, you know, from 15 years ago to 10 years ago, he had a hand in most of those um, productions. So there are a lot of, a lot of those kinds of roles, but maybe more in the marketing side than in the entertainment side. Long answer. <laughs> um, I think we covered the next one. Do we miss one ago. from, can you talk a little bit about Mito? Yeah, we already, we already yeah. answered oh, that yeah. one um, before. So next one is, as an international student, I would like to know where other previous international students working. Uh, do you have any international student specific employment results to share? Um, oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we did an info session, particularly for international students um, in December. And I want to share that uh, some of our international students, so for example, like Yvonne, she's from China. Um, she haven't graduated yet, but she has already got a contractor position at Microsoft um, as a full time as a content strategist. And she started her career at C plus C and it was a PR agency. And she did that at her, uh, during the summer for her internship. So you can see like how our international student build on their career step by step. So another example is um, uh, we have Kabri from cohort seven, 17 and she's from India and she's currently working at SAP as a full time and her company sponsored for her H1B visa as well. Mm -hmm. So these are two like examples. And if you're interested in talking about more, talking with our international students and I'm happy to be the connection, to make the connection for you. Um, I know that a couple of our uh, international students are currently doing their um, internship full-time or part-time while they're still working on their uh, degrees. So that really helped them to um, expand their network and build on their career experience after they finish their um, like program. And one more thing that I would love to highlight is that our communication leadership is a STEM program, which means that after you graduate as an international student, you're qualified for um, the two-year extension OPT, so you will have three years OPT in total um, as an international student, where most of uh, communication degree only has one year. So that's something that I would love to share with you. Yep. Oh, can you repeat details on the startup fair? Yes. So first Friday. Yeah, the first Friday. So if you go to our website, go to the calendar page, and you can tell you can see more details about our uh, first Friday at Commotion. It's actually called Second Friday for the for the title because uh, generous tense is the yeah, first week <laughs> yeah. that we start our. Uh, Winter Clutter. So I will also like uh, email everyone, our participants about our upcoming events. So you can RSVP based on my email. Yeah, yeah. and there will be social media posts that are happening and there will be more about those uh, coming up. So if you're following us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you should be seeing stuff about that in the coming week as well. Yeah, of course. And you're in, we encourage you to follow us on social media so you can get a chance to see authentic student yeah. experience. Yeah, and uh, Liao mentioned that, that this is this uh, second Friday this weekend, mm -hmm. uh, or this Friday is uh, open to prospective students. We usually only do that once a, a year, um, and it's a good opportunity to get FaceTime with some people on staff with uh, Liao and um, I think I can, I've seen our co-director will be there and others. So, um, you know, definitely don't be shy about coming to that and introduce yourself to us. You know, uh, we definitely want to meet you and it's always, that's another way to boost your application is, uh, right. Have, a, have an in-person conversation with people on the application committee first, and um, then it'll be easier for us to, to remember you and kind of understand your story and what you want to do with this program. Okay. Are there 
other classes or courses content that is more specifically, yeah. Yeah, uh, geared towards internal, communication. internal yeah. communication and or change management. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that's a big area of emphasis in the MCCN track. Um, the second uh, core class that Akin teaches um, has a lot of uh, emphasis on organizational identity, organizational values. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of people coming into our program and leaving our program going into um, with, you know, like a lot of HR uh, kind of experience and um, definitely internal communication. There's a ton of that happening at Microsoft um, and, and we have a lot of people working in that world. Um, and maybe you guys can help me with specific classes, uh, certainly, that core class, uh, Anita Verna Crofts teaches a listening and leadership class that is is a lot about uh, you know leadership, internal communication, um, and uh, you know that that's that's as much about listening as it is about talking and communicating. Um, there's Keila Hall's new class that started last quarter. I can't remember the title of that, but that has a, a, a strong organizational identity and change um, emphasis. Um, Oh, there's the Sarah Ross's class. Yeah, uh, which I guess is equity in, uh, initiatives. Um, Leadership approaches to equity initiatives and organizations. So yeah, uh, we're, we're building out the parts of our curriculum that emphasize diversity, equity, and inclusion um, when it comes to, uh, you know, organizational emphases. Uh, there's also been a lot of emphasis on um, accessibility, uh, both from the external communication standpoint and the internal communication standpoint. Um, we did a our uh, master class last year is that um, so yeah there are quite a few uh, the MCCN degree is is newer um, so we've been working to develop uh, the curriculum there so there are always new classes coming up there another one that we were talking about recently is we have a um, ethics of a couple of ethical uh, ethically oriented classes around uh, VR um, somebody from an alum who works at Facebook uh, is teaching a class on uh, responsible was, communication for VR AR. Yeah, yeah responsible communication for VR AR and then uh, there's an ethical uses of big data class that's uh, being taught for the first time this coming quarter as well so you can see how those would have um, sort of internal communication emphases, uh, especially for people going to these big companies. And I think it's going to be a growing role as the, the public pressure mounts for uh, big tech companies to, to live their stated values and, um, you know, to make sure that the new technology that they're deploying to the public is uh, in line with, you know, the, the expectations for um, their ethics. Okay. I see another student ask about First Friday. <laughs> yeah. And thanks. Um, thanks so much, Katie, for sharing the the link, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. Take the initiative. Yeah. Um, I think we're right. Do you have any other questions? So if you don't have any other questions, and we can go very quickly about our upcoming like events, admission events. So this Saturday, um, January 11th, we'll host, a student ambassador will host an online session, Q&A session. Um, if you are interested in talking with our current students and want to learn more about their experience, and you are welcome to join their event. And you can register through our website if you go to animation um, events page, and you can RSVP. I will also send you a follow-up email with all the details. Um, and uh, this is our search on like chess. The last uh, on like chess before our priority admission deadline is uh, January 27th. We'll have the, our last um, information session. So if you have more questions about your application before our second, uh, before our February search deadline, and you are, you are welcome to RSVP for that event. Um, and also for the commotion events, I will um, for our second Friday commotion event, I will also include that in a follow-up email. So do you have anything else to add? Um, I could talk a little about the application. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had that many uh, logistics questions, mm -hmm. which um, hopefully that means you all read our how to apply page yeah. and are familiar <laughs> with everything. Um, but just some common questions that come up about the application. Um, first, it's all online. Do not mail anything. Um, anything that's mailed will be shredded. Um, so please don't do that. Um, we, we don't need official transcripts. You only need your unofficial transcripts that you upload in the online application. And that can be either a scan of an official transcript that you've opened. Um, once you open it, it's not official anymore. 
Um, or if your university has like a web portal where you can print out your academic history, make a PDF of that, um, that works too. It just has to be something that shows the classes you've taken, grades received, and any degrees um, that you've been granted um, for that. Um, the other thing about your recommenders, make sure if you haven't yet, designate your recommenders in the application as soon as possible. Um, those are due by February 3rd as well. I mean, the application deadline is a completion deadline for all aspects of the application. Um, and when you designate your recommenders in there with their email address, they get an email immediately. So first make sure they've already agreed um, to write your recommendation before you enter them because that email goes out by the system as soon as you, you enter them in the application. Um, but you wanna give them plenty of um, you know, lead, uh, um, lead time there to complete that so that you're not designating them on the deadline and then it tells them this is due today. Because um, I get a lot of angry emails from people saying, how am I supposed to complete this in two hours? <laughs> so designate them now and give them some time uh, to complete that recommendation so they can get it in by the third. Um, I think the other thing, the deadline is midnight. So 11.59, 59 Seattle time uh, on fe Monday, February 3rd is when your application is due. Um, TOEFL scores, for those of you that have to submit them, um, be sure you request those at least two weeks before that deadline because it takes five to 10 business days for us to receive those scores. So don't wait until the deadline to request them or your application won't be uh, finished in time. Um, so we do need everything to be in by midnight, February 3rd. Um, and a lot of people don't realize how long it takes for those scores to send. It's not instant, it can take two weeks, sometimes three weeks. Um, so request those as soon as possible if you need to have those sent. I think those are all the big uh, logistics things about the application. Um, if you have more questions, please, um, I'm gonna type in the chat box here. Please email us. Our email is comlead at uw.edu. So be sure to send any follow-up questions or if you're confused about anything with the application, wanna know about any of the events and can't find it on that calendar link um, that was posted, then um, feel free to email. Anything yeah. else? No, we look forward to getting to know you better through your applications and maybe at a yeah. second Friday <laughs> um, on Friday. And um, yeah, thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, yeah. thanks everyone. Day. Thank you, Megan. Thank no you. problem. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, good. Hey, it's not even talking about it. Yeah.